Welcome to Northwest Bible Church. Glad you joined us today. Uh, we are again privileged to have Mr. Brady Cohn with us today. He is going to bring a second sermon. He started last week with his testimony. This week, he is going to be discussing the eight lies about homosexuality uh, that our culture has embraced. And he's going to approach it from a biblical context. Um, those eight lies will be familiar as he uh, introduces them to you. And we do thank him for his um, scholarly approach to this subject and uh, one that is very personal to him. So thank you, Brady. Appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor uh, to turn the, turn the time over to Brady. Marriage, And then today I'm tackling the specific topic of homosexuality. What does the Bible say about homosexuality and how do we respond to this in our culture? So like I said, this can be a little more theologically based, uh, scripture based than um, most of the messages I give. And, and part of my, my heart behind that is that we can be equipped, but I also always want us to be very cautious when we have these theological discussions. And we need to understand that being equipped from God's word, uh, especially in a difficult painful, hot-button issue like this is not so that we have weapons so that we can throw jabs at people, not so that we can win the newest debate on Facebook and really throw it in someone's face of, look, here's the truth. Uh, this isn't just a, a theological issue. It isn't just a discussion. It isn't just a cultural war or rallying cry. At the heart of it is people and many people who are hurting, many people who have been hurt by the church, people who have been hurt by Christians, and they don't need just talking points. They need compassion. They need the love of Christ. Uh, and it isn't just the people out there in the world. It's people in here. It affects people right here in this church. So that's my prayer as, that as we uh, understand Scripture, that we don't use it to, as a weapon to fight against people. We use it as a weapon to fight for people. And we use it as a tool to win people's hearts, not just win the debate. So this morning, I'm going to start out uh, in Romans chapter 1. This is one of the, the, the famous passages about uh, homosexuality. There's, it's, it's, homosexuality is mentioned a handful of times in the Bible. This is one of the passages people go to. So I'm just going to start with one verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. It says, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so they, they uh, exchange a truth about God for a lie. That's really where all sin starts. That's really where all dysfunction starts is that we, we take the truth and we exchange it for a lie. We believe a lie. Our, our heart deceives us and it causes us to act and believe and, and have thoughts and things that are not in line with God's word. It all starts with trading God's truth for a lie. And so after I came to know Christ, uh, about 15 years ago while I was in college, God revealed to me lie after lie that I, I had believed that had led me to the life that I'd been living. Uh, and he started to untangle those lies. He started to reveal layers of my heart and, and uh, trade those lies for his truth. And so today I would like to share with you eight lies that I had believed and that our culture believes about homosexuality that had led me and led leads other people to living that life, to the LGBT community and that identi identity. So the first lie is this, that the Bible isn't actually clear about homosexuality. Uh, and this, uh, believe it or not, some of you guys might be very steadfast in this, like how can anyone believe that? We have scripture right in front of us, but this can be really easy to believe. Uh, all you have to do is Google it, and there's so many websites and articles and opinions that come up about how the Bible isn't actually talking about modern-day homosexuality. It's not talking about homosexuality that, as we know it, between two consenting adults. They claim that in the Bible is talking about homosexuality, uh, that it's actually talking about pedophilia, rape, and a variety of other issues. And so they, they claim that it just isn't referring to two consenting adults in a relationship. So we want to examine, is that true? So we're going to look at some passages. Uh, but I also wanted to give this disclaimer, is that uh, as we kind of have this cultural conversation about uh, sexuality, uh, and we, we dive into you know, these few passages that talk about um, homosexuality, I really think that... Uh, um, uh, we could make an argument against homosexuality just 
even without using these six verses, if you had uh, just the entirety of Scripture uh, and you, you presented God's plan for humanity, God's creation of gender, uh, God's mission and purpose in marriage, like Thais has been uh, teaching you guys last several weeks, that alone should be uh, um, good enough to, to see that homosexuality is not what God intended for us. But since he did give us scripture talking about it, it's important that um, uh, we, we, we understand and know how to apply it. And so uh, some of these uh, misconceptions of scripture, um, this twisting of scripture to, to say that it doesn't actually mean what it says it means or what we've been teaching that it means is what we call revisionist theology. They kind of revise what uh, the text says. And so um, I'm going to explain several areas of revisionist theology than what, what the actual truth is. Um, and this revisionist theology is uh, all over the internet. It's, it's, it's everywhere. You can find it in books. There's uh, dozens of books uh, from this perspective, and so people can so easily be be deceived. And I have a little meme I found with a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, if it's on the internet, it must be true. So, uh, right? And so uh, sometimes we just believe what's on the internet, uh, even though um, it's not true, but it can be very, very convincing. So I say all that uh, to say that when people are caught in this deception, um, uh, there's, there's, there's reason there. They have, they've done research and they have very convincing arguments, uh, or so it seems. And so we need to have compassion towards that. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the observations I've made about people who subscribe and fall into this revisionist theology, they're affirming of, um, the LGBT community and same-sex relationships and same-sex marriage, uh, one of the, the, the observations I make is that they don't have the same view of God and Scripture as uh, what we would have. And so many times I have people come to me and it's like, okay, how do, how do I explain these few verses to convince uh, this person that homosexuality is a sin? And I usually ask them to back up and look at the bigger picture and start asking some questions. Because if they start asking some questions, this person probably does not understand uh, uh, God's word the way that we do. They don't have the same hermeneutics of, of dissecting God's word and interpreting what it means. They don't understand the authority that God's word has in our life. They don't have a biblical view of, of creation and uh, gender and who God is and uh, God's purpose for us on earth. And so in reality, trying to convince them that just these six verses uh, mean that they should, you know, repent of their sin or not believe this when they don't have a biblical understanding of God's word to begin with is futile. So sometimes we need to step back and look at the bigger picture of what does this person believe about uh, God's word and uh, the authority it has in our life because really then their view on homosexuality or sexuality in general is just, uh, you know, a symptom of that much larger issue. My, my second observation is that for the most part, it's more than just an academic or a theological argument. It's usually personal. It's painful. There's been deep wrestling and many times rejection, and their experiences have led them to sometimes bitterness and hard-heartedness. So while it's great to have theological conversations and dig into the Word, we need to do it with compassion. It's like I said, we win over their hearts. Uh, sometimes I, I minister to a lot of parents, and sometimes I have uh, um, parents, I'm, I'm, you know, who are in this situation where their child has come out of the closet or they're struggling with same-sex attraction, and they've been convinced that homosexuality isn't wrong. And as we dig into that, uh, sometimes they've been presented with this false dichotomy of either uh, I condemn my child uh, and re completely reject them because it's a sin, or I love my child and celebrate this part of their life. Those are the only two options that they seemingly have been given in the church world that they were in. And so sometimes uh, it's like, well, of course they love their child. And so if those are the two options, then they kind of cave on this one theological issue because they don't understand that they can call sin a sin and still deeply love their child. And so many times it's a, it's a personal issue and we need to dig into those layers of someone's heart to understand uh, where has their heart twisted something? What's going on in their heart? Uh, where has their heart gotten wrong? What have been their experiences that have led them to this place? So with all that said, we are going to 
dig into Romans 1. So I'm going to read a little bit more of the, the uh, uh, bigger context of Romans 1. So we're going to start in Romans 1, verse 21. Romans 1, verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they came, became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this reason god gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those who are contrary to nature and men likewise gave up natural relations with women who are consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error now when we look at this passage uh where revisionist theology, the, the theology that says that this isn't actually talking about um, homosexuality as we know it, uh, they make a couple of different arguments here. Uh, one is that they say that the sin this is talking about in this passage is the sin of acting unnaturally. And they would claim that some people naturally have hetero, a heterosexual orientation, uh, this attraction towards the opposite gender, but others naturally have a homosexual orientation. And so they say that the sin here would be a heterosexual man who is acting uh, in a, in a same-sex way because that's going again against his nature and vice versa. They'd also say that some, some men are born with a uh, homosexual orientation and therefore acting with a woman would be also against his nature. And so they're claiming that this is just an act that's unnatural to these specific people uh, by having relationships with someone with a gender that doesn't come natural to you. And so there's a couple areas, though, where this does not hold up to truth. The first is this. Uh, it says that the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. And so as we look at the context of this passage, uh, men consumed with passion for one another, that by definition is not a heterosexual man who is having sexual relations with another man. A man who burns with passion for another man is by definition homosexual by nature, homosexual in his orientation. And so a heterosexual man does not burn with passion for another man. If he does, he's not a heterosexual man. And so by their very own uh, arguments and their very own definitions, this is a logical fallacy. And, and as Christians who believe in the Bible, we believe that uh, homosexuality is not natural. And we will, we'll, we'll get to that a little later on. But uh, their, their whole argument is that um, it's this acting unnaturally, uh, um, but by their very own definitions, uh, that, just, that just can't be true. It's a complete logical fallacy that uh, really does, just does not hold water. Secondly, the term that Paul uses for unnatural is this Greek phrase. Um, and I always uh, get ton tongue-tied when I'm trying to speak Greek. It's all, it's all kind of Greek to me. Uh, I always joke that I, when I was growing up, I had a lot of years of speech therapy. I really struggled with speech. And I would say, I can't learn another language. I hardly learn English, and I grew up in America. So, uh, so Greek is definitely a struggle. But uh, as we study this Greek phrase, um, the, the, the phrase in the original language in Greek that Paul used for unnatural was this Greek, uh, Greek phrase. It's on the screen called uh, ten parafusen. And so this, this phrase ten parafusen, the, the, the Greek phrase that's translated unnatural, was a uh, term that's used a couple places in the Bible, but it's also used throughout Greek literature. And the, the phrase was commonly used uh, uh, to describe unnatural relationships, which uh, usually meant uh, relationships between two men or two women. Um, it, it wasn't uh, 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 unknown that homosexuality existed in this culture. It was written about. It was in Greek literature. You can read about, I know, in the works of like Philo and different uh, Greek um, scholars and philosophers um, that they use this word referring to homosexuality, homosexuality as we know it between uh, two consenting adults. And so um, this was a well-known phrase we see in Scripture and throughout uh, 
Greek literature that the meaning is very well known. The meaning is very settled. It doesn't mean these other things like pedophilia. It means homosexuality between two consenting adults. That's what Paul regards as unnatural. So we can see in this passage that there was a progression. It wasn't a heterosexual person who decided to have an encounter with someone of the same gender. It was a person who had been deceived. Uh, that's where sin always starts. They had traded God's truth for a lie, and therefore they worshipped uh, creation instead of the creator. They worshipped images of God instead of God himself. And that's why we call the sin of idolatry. And I've seen that idolatry in my own heart, this idolatry of trying to find uh, my hope and my value and my wholeness from another person, thinking I can acquire those things from another person instead of from Christ. My own heart has gone down that path, and I've worshipped images of God instead of God himself. We all do that. We all, we all turn creation into idols. And we're people who are made in the image of God. So sexual sin is, is this very same thing. It's talking about Romans 1 is worshipping creation because, uh, worshipping images of God because people are made in the image of God. So when we idolize another person, uh, which we do in, in sexual sin with that person, we're really worshipping uh, them as an image of God instead of worshiping God himself. But thankfully, um, uh, over the course of time, God took me down this road of sanctification, of revealing the lies that my heart had believed and trading them for his truth. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he took me down this reverse course of Romans 1, where uh, with the Holy Spirit, I could change the way I was living. I could change my behavior. Then through the course of time, through sanctification, uh, he could reveal the lies that my heart had believed so I could trade them for his truth. And that's, uh, that's the path he has of sanctification for all of us who know Christ, that we can go down this reverse course of, of repenting of our sin and trading the lies that we've believed for his truth. The next passage I'd like to look at is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Um, I use this passage a lot when I, I'm sharing my story and talking about, about sexuality. This is one kind of the go-to passages when we talk about homosexuality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And so uh, that's a very uh, packed, loaded uh, couple of verses there. And, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot, that I always see that passage pointed just towards the homosexual community, kind of in this self-righteous way. But really that list of sins covers, covers all of us. But I want to focus on uh, uh, the, what, what's translated to men who practice homosexuality. That's where revisionist theologians would say, well, that doesn't actually mean uh, homosexuality per se, homosexuality as we know it in our culture. But there's, there's two words there in the Greek that are translated to this phrase uh, in the ESV that says men who practice homosexuality. Uh, there's those, these two words. The first one is uh, uh, maloi, malakoi, excuse me, I can... There I am with my Greek again, malakoi. And so malakoi in the Greek refers to, uh, in a relationship with two men, uh, the more passive role in the relationship, the more effeminate one, uh, which they had many times in a same-sex relationship. And then there's another word, uh, uh, arsenokoi, excuse me, I, I always mess that one up. Uh, arsenokoi, that, now that was even worse. I should just give up now. So it's on the screen behind you. So, uh, um, so these two words are, are what's used in the Greek that's translated to uh, the phrase uh, men who practice homosexuality. And the first one, I like said, is the more passive, uh, effeminate role. The, the second one uh, is the more masculine role. And it literally means, uh, when you break down the Greek, the two parts of the word are male and bed. It's a man who takes another man to bed with him. And... This was often used in, in Greek literature to reference uh, um, homosexuality, people who are in same-sex relationships. And uh, the, when you look at the context of how those two words were used in culture, um, it has nothing to do with pedophilia or rape or uh, um, any of those 
those issues, it's, it's used in a context as we know it of homosexuality of a man in a relationship with another man or two women in a relationship together. The next passage I would like to look at uh, is uh, 1 Timothy 1. And so 1 Timothy 1 also mentions homosexuality. Starting in verse 8, it says, Now we know that God is good if one uses, excuse me, that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel, the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And so uh, we, we don't have to take long in this passage to look at this because the, the same Greek word, arson, no koi, uh, to, excuse me, is uh, the same, same word used in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 is, is the same word here in this passage. And so we see this pattern of uh, the same word that's used in Greek literature is the word that Paul used to describe homosexuality. And so that just is more affirmation that this isn't talking about something else. This is talking about homosexuality as we understand it. The next one is this. Uh, uh, Jude 1 7 says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve in an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. And so as it's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah from the Old Testament, uh, and it uses, uh, it says sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires. The, the term there for unnatural desires is the very same, same Greek phrase that we saw in Romans 1, where, where Paul talks about homosexuality. And there he specifically talked about men having relations with men and women having relationship with, with one another. And that's the same phrase he uses here, uh, to say that they pursued a natural desire and it's in the context of sin and other sexual immorality. And so that's a summary of what uh, the New Testament says about homosexuality. I think it's, it's very straightforward on um, what it says and its meaning and we can rest assured that this isn't a gray area. This is something that the, the New Testament affirms over and over again that homosexuality in the way that we understand it in our culture is contrary to God's design in nature. So what does the Old Testament say? Uh, many times I hear the argument, well, it's like, well, the Old Testament doesn't really matter anyway uh, because we're under the new covenant. Um, and so uh, and it, that usually comes from such a misunderstanding of the Old Testament and the role that it plays in our life. Homosexuality is mentioned a couple of times in the Old Testament. Leviticus 22 excuse me, Le Leviticus 18, verse 22, says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus then 20, 13 says, if a man lies with a uh, male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. And so what does revisionist theology say? Revisionist, revisionist theology would say that the Old Testament law is void because we're under the new covenant. And so I, I hear this all the time. You see this in blog posts and conversations uh, to say, oh, you can't use the Old Testament to condemn homosexuality because do you also eat shellfish and wear clothing with fibers that have, uh, you know, part cotton, part something else? Because those are part, that's part of the Old Testament law too. And so that's uh, kind of the excuse that, that people use or the comparisons that make, they make. But are they equal, those, are those equal comparisons uh, to those different parts of the law? Uh, um, are, are they no longer valid in today's New Testament Christianity? To understand that, you have to understand the purpose of the law in the Old Testament. Uh, that the law that God gave to the, to the Jews, the Israelites, to his chosen people, there are three parts of, of the Mosaic law. And so I just want to break down what were those three different classifications or uh, descriptions of the law and what were their purposes? So the first one was civil law. Uh, this, the civil law in the Old Testament is really what we would know today as civil law. It, it handled everyday issues amongst people. Uh, it handled uh, what happens when there's a crime, robbery, extortion, um, uh, how to do commerce, how to do business, 
you know, these different business practices, justice. It was really the law of uh, how do we function together as a people, which all modern countries uh, have today. We have civil law. Uh, but this law expired. This law is no longer valid. It expired uh, with the demise of the Jewish civil government because that's what it was made and given to govern was the Jewish civil government. Um, next, we have the ceremonial law. So these are, are laws um, all about like the priestly duties, laws of atonement, um, the, the rules for sacrifice at that time. This was before the days of Jesus when he was the ultimate sacrifice. And so they sacrificed animals. And so uh, they had festivals and all these traditions that they did to honor the Lord and, and to show their sacrifice and their commitment. So these were ceremonial laws. And these laws expired because Christ fulfilled the priestly work. He fulfilled this area of the law. Uh, he says he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so he, he fulfilled uh, this law is the ultimate sacrifice. So those laws no longer apply to the New Testament church. But the third category of law is moral law. These laws have no expiration because uh, they're based on God's character. They're based on who God is, which has not changed. They're, they're based on... Um, uh, God's desire for his people. Their law is like, let's say, do not steal or lie. Do not oppress your neighbor. Do not commit idolatry. Do not sacrifice your children. Uh, don't commit I adultery, incest, bestiality, homosexuality. All those things are, uh, then also love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, those are part of the moral law that reflect the character of God, that he desires to be reflected in his people. And that has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So uh, one, one last argument from the revisionist theology uh, is that Jesus never spoke of homosexuality. And so they say, well, Jesus never talked about it, so obviously it's, it's not a sin or it's not important. And so if, if Jesus never talked about it, then, uh, then obviously um, it, it, we can't preach that it's wrong. And so I have three responses to that argument. Um, Jesus did affirm in Matthew 19 uh, God's design for biblical marriage. Uh, Matthew 19, he said, starting in verse 4, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And so God was excuse me, Jesus himself was looking at Old Testament creation in Genesis and God's design for marriage between a man and a woman, and he was affirming that that was the truth. Secondly, uh, there's a lot of things that Jesus didn't directly talk about, or at least things that weren't recorded in, in the canon of Scripture that God gave us. There's lots of modern social issues that that Jesus didn't speak of. He didn't speak about abusing elderly people. But when we say that, well, that's okay because Jesus didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about speeding when you're driving down the road, which uh, I unfortunately have done too many times and uh, paid the price for it through civil law. Uh, and so Jesus didn't talk about these things. There's many, many serious moral issues that he didn't talk about. But thankfully, we don't have just... <clears throat> The words of Jesus to live by, uh, the, our, our basis for the truth we live by and, and the morality that God calls us to and the life he calls us to live isn't just in the words of Jesus. It's in the entirety of Scripture from, from front to back. And so all of Scripture is God-breathed. And, and so we look to the words of Jesus and to the words of Paul and the rest of the Old Testament and New Testament authors because what they wrote is the infallible, inerrant word of God also. And so we can uh, look at the entire view of Scripture uh, from beginning to end and see that uh, um, it, it does uh, give us a different way to live. And it does condemn homosexuality, even though Jesus didn't directly utter those words. Lastly, Jesus didn't come and start a new religion. The story of Jesus doesn't start in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. 
uh, it started in Genesis 1-1, because the new covenant wasn't the beginning of a new religion. It was the next chapter in God's story for his people. It was a continuation of what God was already doing. So we're in a new chapter under a new covenant, but God's, uh, uh, the religion, the faith that God started starts in Genesis 1-1, and we're not separated from the truth of the Old Testament. All right, well, that was lie number one out of eight. Uh, so I hope none of you guys had lunch plans today. I'm sure being Mother's Day, none of you did. Uh, so I, I promise uh, the rest of these we'll get through much, much quicker. Um, but I think that that theological piece and being, being equipped to understand what does the Bible actually say is important. So I wanted to focus most of my time on that. But I also wanted to speak to what were some other lies that I believed that led me to live that life in the gay community? What were the lies I believed? What are the lies that our society is believing and teaching that is convincing us to sway from God's word? And so lie number two is this. For God to love me, I have to fix myself. I have to change myself. I have to walk away from this. And that's where I spent years of my life trying to, under my own strength, trying to fix myself. But Luke 5 32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so it's like, there's no righteousness underneath our own power. We need the work of Christ in our life to do that. I, I, I've said this probably at this church, is that I feel like this is one issue where uh, we somehow expect to convince non-believers to live a biblical life. We expect them to somehow try to fix themselves, to repent of their sin, to, to stop doing what their heart so desperately wants to do. But not only do they not have the power to do that, but convincing a, a LGBT person, a homosexual person to live a different life, if they don't know Jesus, that does nothing for their soul. And so it's Jesus who is going to change them. They're to come to Jesus the way that they are. Uh, and he's the one who takes them down this journey of sanctification. Lie number three is that my value is found in self-expression. And this is what our culture is telling us right now. This is everywhere in our culture that the foundation of our humanity is self-expression. The expressing the feelings that are happening inside of us. The problem is that uh, our feelings come from our heart and our heart is deceitful. But we worship the self-expression. And sometimes uh, um, I, I see that even inside the church. And I see it within homosexuality is that... Uh, and with gender issues is that whatever we're feeling inside of us, being able to express that and celebrate that is the foundation of my humanity and where I get my value. And so we see in this, you know, teaching on idolatry in God's Word in Romans 1, uh, most of the idolatry they were committing uh, then was uh, worshiping creation days 1 through 5, worshiping animals, worshiping things, worshiping you know, gold, money, uh, all these things. But uh, now our affections have turned to day six creation, which is man. We worship other people and we worship ourselves. Uh, we live in a culture that's all about self-worship. And we've even made relationships in a self-worship. Uh, we, we pursue people not be based on the mission that God has for us, but we pursue people based on how they make me feel. And that is not biblical love. That is the self-love of, of, of feeling. And uh, we, we see it everywhere in our culture, and we're not immune to it as Christians. Uh, we see it today in, in worshiping creation and worshiping how we make, uh, how, worshiping how we feel. Uh, one, one, one of the ways I see us do this in the church sometimes is kind of the buzzword in the church the last few years is authenticity. We want uh, lots of authenticity, which is great. We need more authenticity. We need people to be real about themselves. We need a place where we can be honest and uh, about our struggles and, and be authentic. And I believe that this church is a place that has grown so much in that area. But, but we can always idolize and worship good things and make them an end to themselves when they're actually just a, a means to an end. And so authenticity of being honest about where our heart is at should be the means to an end. It should be the means to confession and repentance and then restoration, not this virtue in itself in which we uh, kind of then just wallow in this place where we, uh, you know, we, we acknowledge our brokenness, we acknowledge our pain, we acknowledge our dysfunction. 
but uh, we kind of worship this area of, of authenticity and stay there instead of using that as one step to uh, honor Christ and bring glory to him by finding healing and finding hope in the gospel. Uh, Light number four is this. I'm born this way. And so this is something we, we see all the time, and our culture thinks it's so foolish if you would suggest that an LGBT person isn't born that way. In fact, they think it's hate speech. Uh, they think it's, it's cruel, it's inhumane to even suggest that. And uh, one of the questions I'd like to answer is, does it, does it matter? Uh, because in one, on one hand, it does matter because we're all born into sin. So let's say they found a, a, a part of your genetics or something that, uh, that some people were born, which they've never found anything like that. They've never found anything that, that proves scientifically that people were born with same-sex attraction or born gay. Uh, but let's say they did. Uh, it really wouldn't matter because we're all born into sin and we're all called to repentance. We're all given the power and the Holy Spirit to deny ourselves of the things that sometimes feel like they come so natural to us. But I, I 100% with all of my being don't uh, believe that we're born that way because I understand that the human heart is deceitful and it twists things and it lines and worships creation which takes us down on this path of having unnatural desires for one another. I've seen that idolatry in my own life, and I've seen it in the lives of so many others who have gone down this road towards homosexuality. I see the idolatry of looking to another person uh, to find my value and my hope. And as I've repented of that, and I've, I've been transformed in that, um, the, these attractions and feelings that society says I'm born with, uh, they, they, they go away, they're diminished. Uh, God, God heals that area of our lives uh, over the course of our lifetime um, because we're not born with it. It's a product of our heart trading God's truth for a lie. Line number five. I have to understand what everything will look like. I think that this is something that we can all get caught up on when it comes to our, our walk with the Lord. Um, when I first came to know Christ, or when uh, even before I came to know Christ, as I was wrestling through these spiritual issues, it's like, I can't imagine what obedience would look like. Uh, I can't imagine actually walking away from this. I can't imagine not uh, um, satisfying this area of my flesh. And so I can't take that step because it's almost like putting, making ourselves God. And I, I, I see this in so many issues within the church. If, if we can't personally understand it, then we're not willing to go there. Uh, but instead we can trust in God's promises and trust in his faithfulness that he has something better for us than we ever could have imagined. And so we have to trust and take steps forward in faith even when we don't understand what repentance is going to look like. Lie number six. Maybe I can have Jesus and be gay too. That's, that's something that I, I wrestled with for so much in my life. And uh, coming to grips with, with the truth was hard. It was painful uh, because I didn't know what that would look like. I, I, it was almost this mourning of mourning that I can never fulfill these desires that, uh, that feel so deeply embedded inside of me. And so, but as I, as I studied God's word and I, I came to the conclusion that, uh, that nothing in God's word um, condones me uh, uh, continuing to live that life. And so I need to surrender to all of God's word. I can't pick and choose what I, what I believe and what I surrender to. But, but coming to grips with that was difficult. And, and so therefore, I needed people to walk beside me. I needed people to walk beside me with love and compassion and grace uh, as they um, uh, understood that this is uh, a tough, um, sometimes cost, a tough cross to bear. Uh, there's a big cost to discipleship uh, in this area. And sometimes as Christians, we kind of dismiss it as just this easy repentance. Oh, that person's living in sin. They need to repent. Um, but there's a cost to it. It's, it's ugly, it's messy, and it's worth it. And God calls us to it, and it brings glory to him, and it gives us a better life, but there's still a cost to it. Uh, there's people who are living in a same-sex repentance, or excuse me, a same-sex relationship. For them, repentance means leaving a person that they genuinely love. There's a cost and a mourning and a, a heaviness to that that we need to show compassion for and walk alongside 
people in. There's people in the LGBT community where that's the community where they are loved and they are valued and they're understood. And we need to be a community where we walk alongside them with an even better love and an even better value for them and understanding them by knowing them deeply. I was, uh, uh, a while back, I got together with a college student who had wanted to talk to me, and um, he himself didn't struggle with, with same-sex attraction, but uh, he was raised by two women who were, who were married, and uh, she had come to know Christ and you know, had a biblical understanding of sexuality, and he wanted his moms to repent of their sin and to be made whole in Christ, but for him, that meant his parents would be getting a divorce and his family would be ripped apart. Like, that's a heaviness and a cost of discipleship that the church is not good at acknowledging and walking people through with love and grace. It's more of a matter of, than a matter of, oh, we want these two people to repent. There is a cost to this discipleship. Uh, and if we're going to call them to repentance, we have to walk alongside them in that. <clears throat> Why number seven? Uh, heterosexuality and or marriage can save me, rescue me, heal me, or at least be a sign that God has healed me. Uh, this is an attitude I see so many places within inside the church. Uh, and usually it's coming from, you know, genuine motives. Uh, we want the best for people. But I think it kind of shows a misplaced view of marriage and what marriage can do for us. And uh, so many times, um, and this so this is for the mothers here. Uh, so many times I talk with moms uh, who have, you know, heterosexual, completely heterosexual sons, and, but they're just it's like, oh, if my son could just find the right woman, I think he'd be okay. It's like, uh, your son doesn't need the right woman. Your son needs Jesus. Like, a woman is not going to fix his sin. Only Jesus is going to do that. And he needs Jesus first so he can love this woman well, whoever God has for him. It's through Jesus that he'll have everything he needs in Christ so that he can love her unconditionally. But we've been looking to people for our restoration and for our hope since the beginning of time. Going back in Genesis 29, the story of uh, Rachel and Jacob, uh, I don't have time to get very deep into it, but Rachel's, excuse me, Jacob's life is a mess, and he flees his homeland, and he sees this beautiful woman that he's just infatuated with, and he's so obsessed with her that he's willing to uh, give seven years of his life to be a slave to have her, and then he's tricked, and so then he has to give seven more years of his life in slavery to have Rachel as his wife. And so was, was Jacob's vision to be with Rachel, this godly vision of walking together in deep friendship on the mission that God has for them, like Tice has built the, the vision for marriages. No, it was my life is a wreck, and there's this beautiful woman, and I can have redemption from her. But a beautiful woman or a beautiful man or whoever it is on this, this earth cannot redeem us. Only Christ can do that. Lie number eight, I'll, I'll finish it with this. Lie number eight that we believe is that God's grace doesn't apply to me. And uh, part of that was lies that I believed uh, that I know were from the, the devil himself. Some of that was the way that the church talked about homosexuality, talked about it as the one unforgivable sin, which uh, was also a lie that I believed. So I thought that God's grace doesn't apply to me. But we've all twisted uh, um, God's design for marriage and sexuality and just our lives in so many ways. We've all believed lies that have led us to worshiping creation instead of worshiping God. And God's grace is sufficient for all of it. And so I don't know where you guys are at today, wherever you guys are at with marriage, sexuality, whatever circumstances you guys find yourselves in today, God's grace is sufficient, and it's sufficient for your life, and it's sufficient for my life. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Paul, excuse me, Jesus was in the the business of redeeming and restoring people. And Paul wrote, uh, 1 Corinthians, after those two verses on, on homosexuality, he wrote, and that's what some of you were, but you were washed and you were sanctified uh, by the truth of our God and by the spirit of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, your sin is not the end of the story. Uh, 1 Peter 5.10 says, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. 
And so this passage acknowledges sometimes there's suffering. We're in a very temporary season of our life on earth. And sometimes there's suffering. There's, in fact, there's always suffering. But he will restore us. He will uh, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That is the plan that God has for you in your marriage, in your sexuality, in whatever ways your heart has, has deceived you. Thanks for joining us, uh, Brady. Appreciate it very much. And for those of you who watch this uh, ch YouTube channel, uh, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications bell, as well as leave your comments below. We appreciate that. And also, if this has been helpful to you, uh, go ahead and like this video as well. That'll help other people uh, be notified that it's available. So thank you again. Have a great week. We love you. And we pray that this was uh, helpful for you the last two weeks. Have a great week.